environment and society, but I'd like to welcome people at the back who just joined us. And for today's presentation, we have Mike Comito. He's a PhD candidate from McMaster University in the Department of History. And we're lucky that he's here today because he's been living in Sudbury and teaches at Laurentian, but has offered to talk about his PhD dissertation on the history of the spring bear hunt in Northern Ontario. So please join me in welcoming Mike Comito. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here today. So, uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, the history of the spring bear hunt. My wider research deals with the history of black bear hunting and management in Ontario uh, more broadly, but today, given, given the fact that the spring bear hunt is in the news again, I'm going to focus on this and kind of give you some background, and we're going to talk about, you know, how does this relate to the current situation that's going on right now in, uh, in your backyard, right? So, this year actually marks the first Ontario spring bear hunt since 1998. I'd argue that there was one last year. Um, for those of you that are Leafs fans, you know how that ended. It didn't end well for, for Ontario, right? So the Canadians are doing better this year in their spring bear hunt, so hopefully I don't jinx them by throwing that out there, especially for your professor who's obviously a, a Montreal fan. So the overview for today, just to kind of give you an idea of where we're going to go, so you have an idea of what we're going to talk about. Um, Ontario's had a spring bear hunt since 1937, so it actually has a much longer history than some of us might think. Although, for the most part, it didn't attract a lot of attention from residents until the 1980s. And this includes hunting. A lot of residents in the province weren't really interested in spring bear hunting, or even bear, fall bear hunting for that matter, until the 1980s. And for the most part, no one really took stock of what was going on in terms of uh, some of these issues we hear about the spring bear hunt today until the 1980s. For the most part, it was a pretty dormant activity. The reason why uh, it hasn't really been a focal point for the most part, is because for, the long, for a long time, the black bear has been thought of as a nuisance or a pest in Ontario. And we're, I'll get into that a bit today. And this has really shaped the attitudes that people have had in Ontario towards the animal. So you've had decades of viewing the animal as a pest, as a nuisance, as a varmint. This is going to in turn impact how you perceive the animal, how you approach it from a management standpoint and from a hunting standpoint. And again, We'll end the lecture today to kind of bring you up to speed with what's going on right now with the spring bear hunt debate. And again, this is Drip, and we're going to be talking about what drives the spring bear hunt debate. And this includes uh, considerations, ethical considerations, scientific considerations. And because I know this is a geography class, we'll also be talking about how location and place plays a factor or plays a role in uh, in the spring bear hunt debate. So just to give you a little bit of uh, just a little bit of background. So initially in Ontario, early management program. Black bears were viewed as largely as threats to livestock or, uh, or property or even uh, personal property. Um, so for the most part, there was no legislation in place or no regulations in place to kind of govern how or why black bears were killed. Provided that you had a valid firearms license in Ontario in the early 20th century, you were entitled to kill as many black bears as you like, provided that you legally had a gun license. There were no hunting regulations, there were no hunting permits required for black bears uh, if you were a resident of the province. So for the most part, they were little more than an afterthought. No one really thought much of them. If they were a problem, you killed it. And that was plain as simple as that. Uh, the Department of Lands and Forests, which we eventually became Minist Ministry of Natural Resources, didn't really talk about black bears that much. If you were to look at their annual reports from the early 20th century, they would talk about how, how the deer population is doing or how moose hunting is doing and how uh, you know, how the frequency of this, whereas they wouldn't really discuss black bears. It was kind of just, you know, if you happen to have an interesting story about them, they would report that, but otherwise it wasn't really a consideration. However, by the 1930s though, black bears come onto the radar of the province, and a part of this was because the province appointed the Special Committee on the Game Situation in 1933. And what this was, was designed to kind of, they were tasked with assessing the province's uh, game birds, uh, sport fish, and, uh, and game wildlife. So again, they wanted to see you know, what type of hunting pressure were affecting uh, animals such as moose and deer and fish, and what, uh, what kind of long-term impact this would have on, uh, on them in the province. And one of the concerns that the committee had heard during this time was that black bears were increasingly becoming very destructive in Northern Ontario. A lot of people uh, came to the committee with testimony saying that Black bears, for some reason in the 1930s, were becoming uh, more of a nuisance than normal, and they were calling on the government to bring in some additional measures to kind of control the black bear population. Uh, the committee heard from two separate groups. One group had argued that they wanted the government to bring in a bounty program, so thereby the government would pay you a sum of money to kill black bears that came onto your property and, and cause problems. 
Another group had advocated that the government bring in a spring bear hunt. So they, their argument was that the spring bear hunt will, will, like the bounty, will help keep the black bear population in check, but it'll make the bear more of a game animal. So it'll give it a little bit more prestige and rather simply uh, indiscriminately killing them for money. So it'll a little bit more um, elevate the animal a little bit more rather than just simply killing it outright and paying residents to do so. And part of the reason why we see this, act, this, this nuisance spike in the 1930s, it's not, it's not perceived. Um, if we look at the number of black bears that are harvested by licensed trappers, you see that for the most part in the 1920s, there actually is quite a demand and there is considerable trapping pressure on black bears. However, by the end of the 1920s and into the 30s, there is a significant drop off in um, trapping pressure in, in Ontario. And that's because the price of black bear pelts plummeted around this time. So when you think of it this way, there's a considerable drop in trapping pressure. There's really no hunting pressure at the time. So again, this could have an effect on nuisance behavior. There may be, there, maybe there were more bears. And we'll get into this a little bit later because the other factor that uh, wouldn't have been mentioned at the time or we have to do a little bit more research into is what were the natural food sources like at this during this time? You know, maybe this was causing the spike in nuisance behavior that we often hear about today. And this is one of the primary drivers of nuisance bear activity is the availability of natural food sources. So again, it's important to keep in mind that uh, there, there is a drop in hunting and trapping pressure, but again, there could be also other factors at play here as well that could have caused this spike in nuisance activity in 1933. But the committee hears both sides. They hear the arguments for the spring bear hunt, they hear the arguments for the bounty, and they do nothing. They Rather than do, implement a new management program, they just continue with the status quo. However, as we saw earlier with the hunting, with the trapping pressure remaining uh, very low throughout the 1930s, by 1937, the government has heard more and more complaints about the problems with black bears in Northern Ontario. So finally, they implement the first spring bear hunt, which starts in 1937. And so this is launched for non-resident hunters only. So if you were from the United States, or if you were from another province, you could come to Ontario and you could buy a black bear license and hunt them in the springtime. And so this was designed to keep the black bear population in check. You would bring in more hunting pressure to kind of help uh, keep the population at a manageable level. And in turn, because you're marketing this to sport hunters from beyond Ontario, there's also the potential for revenue generation. You're selling licenses. You're potentially uh, catering to the, the tourist outfitter industry and the guide industry. But again, it's not initially very popular, and this is also because we, we see World War II come up in 1939. So again, there's not a lot of hunting during this period necessarily. We see a, a huge spike after the war is over as more people come home. They have more, it's a renewed period of prosperity. There's more recreation time, so more and more people are going out in the bush and they're hunting. But again, for the most part, we see this is where we see the first spring bear hunt, but again, it's not very popular. This is just to give you an idea of, of non-resident spring bear hunting license sales in Ontario. So this is from 1937 and 1961, again, it's, it's very, very little interest generated up until the end of the war. And then we see a significant spike in the 1950s up until by 1961. And it's also important to keep in mind that, again, as I mentioned earlier, if you were a resident of the province and you had a valid firearms license, you could still kill bears at any time of the year, whether it's spring, fall, or winter. But again, so then it's just important to remember that the non-resident spring bear hunt applies to non-residents only. So this was marketed as an activity, as a sport activity, for people outside of the province. Which brings us to uh, the next important era in, uh, in black bear hunting and management, and these are the bounty years. And so from 1942 to 1961, the province instituted a bounty on black bears. And this applied to agricultural and semi-agricultural areas, and for the most part, it would include most of the areas in Northern Ontario. The bounty applied to the Nipissing District, Sudbury, Thunder Bay, etc. So again, if you were in Northern Ontario, odds are, depending on where you lived, you would be eligible to claim the bounty on black bears. So what the government did was, it essentially incentivized residents of the province to kill bears as a way to, again, keep the population in check. We hear more and more complaints in the late 30s and 40s that the black bear, black bear population is getting out of control or they're becoming more of a pest and a nuisance. So the government takes one step beyond uh, the spring bear hunt and they bring in a more, uh, a more comprehensive program to kind of keep the animals in check. So at first they're paying residents $10 to kill adult bears. So a bear over the age of 12 months was subject for a $10 reward. 
And then by 1946, the government brings in a five dollar reward for cubs. So if you killed a, a bear that was under the age of 12 months, that was, that was five dollars. So this is just to give you an idea. Again, it's very erratic. There's not really a consistent pattern in, in why bears are being bountied in a given year. Uh, but we can see here that uh, towards the end of the 1950s, that this is one of the highest uh, peaks we have in terms of in the bounty system. So all told, over this 19 year period, uh, the government paid the bounties on roughly around 15,000 bears, so $150,000 worth. And so this is also occurring at the same time. We have the bounty program in place, but the government is still also marketing the spring bear hunt to non-resident hunters. So this is the first time that we see truly significant uh, pressure on the black bear population. You see it coming from the non-resident hunters that are, that are killing them for sport, and you also see it coming from residents that are killing them simply because uh, they're able to and they're being rewarded for this. So what this does is this really entrenches these attitudes that black bears are pests, they're vermin, they're nuisances. The government has legally classified them as a pest. So this will in turn have an impact on the attitudes and the mindset of people in, North, in, in Northern Ontario for the most part. If you're being told by the government that the black bear is nothing more than a nuisance and hey, I'll give you $10 for every bear you kill, this is gonna shape the way you view the animal and this is gonna shape the way that policy is dictated. So we'll get to that in a little bit, but I just wanted to leave you with those thoughts as we move forward. So we're in the bounty years. We're still, uh, we're gonna move up to 1959. And this is a more, it's a more colorful anecdote with the, it relates to the spring bear hunt. And I think it does have some more, it has some larger implications for management. So I just wanna briefly discuss this. So right here, pictured here is the mayor of Timmins, Ontario, Leo Del Volano. So in 1959, he hears about, or he reads in the newspaper that the Queen's Guards at Buckingham Palace, their, their tall bearskin caps are being criticized for being in poor condition. Uh, there was a, a Londoner walked by on his way to work one day, he wrote an editorial in the Times, and said that how could you possibly have the guards up there with these caps and the condition they are, it's terrible. So this story gets printed around the world because it's, it's interesting that, you know, these are, everyone's familiar with these caps, they're famous, they're synonymous with, with the Queen. So it gets a lot of play in, in newspapers around the globe, it, some, it makes its way to Timmins, uh, the mayor finds out about this story and he cables, he sends a telegram to the British War Office and he says, you guys need more bearskin caps? We have a lot of bears in Timmins, I'll organize a hunt and I'll give you all the bears that we kill. I'll send all the pelts over to England. So for the first time, the mayor takes it upon himself and he organizes the first systematic spring bear hunt in Ontario. So previously up until this point, it was being, it was done, simply, it was done only by non-residents, but now for the first time, we have residents participating in a spring bear hunt for the Queen of England. So from May to June 1959, Leo Del Volano pushes this campaign to help get more bear, bear pelts to send over to the Queen. And it receives worldwide attention. Uh, it's covered by Life Magazine, the BBC, uh, the London Illustrated News does a story on this. And again, all, uh, pretty much most major media outlets in North America were covering the story. It was covered extensively in United States and Canada, and especially in Ontario, because of course these, this was happening in, in our own backyard. And now, initially, people were concerned that given the size of the regiments at the at Buckingham Palace and in the British Army, that this could be a slaughter of thousands of bears. So people are concerned that Del Valeno is going to organize this campaign. It's going to lead to, you know, killing tens of thousands of bears potentially. So we start to see for the first time a lot of backlash being generated. There's a lot of letters being written to the editor in the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, and people are concerned about what's going on. They're, they're questioning the ethics of this. They also are they're questioning the methods that are using. They're questioning baiting the bear to get the bear to come out and then shoot it while it's feeding. And they're also questioning, you know, what, what will happen to cubs whose mothers are killed in the springtime? What will happen to them, right? So we see this orphan cub narrative that we hear about now this is being talked about for the first time in 1959. So what's the actual significance of this event besides me giving you another uh, colorful anecdote to talk about? Well, in the end, they only killed 62 bears. So again, it's a far cry from the initial projection that they were worried about. There wasn't tens of thousands of bears were killed. In fact, it's pretty difficult to kill that many bears in a six week window. So again, they only killed 62 bears despite their best efforts. But what it did do, it made spring bear hunting infamous across the world. For the first time, people in Toronto, and Timmins, and Thunder Bay, and Sudbury, they're getting media coverage about the spring bear hunt. It's coming into their living rooms in the form of their newspapers. They're reading about this. They're reading about how and why these bears are being killed in Timmins. 
And so what I think this does is this, gener this initiates the criticism that we see of the spring bear hunt that would continue for the next 40 years intermittently until it culminates with the decision in 1999 to cancel the spring bear hunt. And so I haven't found that, that nice missing link that says A plus B equals C, but after this hunt was organized, Ontario revamped its black bear hunting and management laws significantly. Whether or not this was a catalyst that did it, that's my argument. I still need to find that those documents that really prove that, but for the most part, given the attention and publicity that it received, a lot of it negative, it's hard to, to, to think that the government didn't want to reassess how it was managing its bears in, in the forest in Northern Ontario, given the fact that it was in all the major broadsheets, people were concerned about this, maybe having a bounty program, maybe killing bears you know, in, in the way that was being done in Timmins, isn't the best way to go about managing this type of natural resource. Sorry, I keep grabbing the water bottle. I don't actually, uh, I'm not actually taking a drink. So, like I said, my argument, I still need to find that, uh, that perfect document that kind of alludes to this, is that after this, you know, this media spring bear hunt, Ontario changes its black bear hunting and management laws. So, the, so for the first time in 1961, the black bear is classified as a big game animal. So it now has much more protection than it previously enjoyed. There's now going to be closed seasons. So you can only hunt the animal uh, in the fall, generally from, uh, from mid-August until the end of October. And then again, you can hunt the animal in the spring, roughly from May 1st until June 15th. So very similar hunting seasons as we have now. But again, this is the first time that the government brings in some protection for the animal besides simply uh, killing it uh, for money. However, there are problems with this system. Uh, the first issue is that they bring in a combination licensing system. And what this means is that rather than buying simply a black bear license, you're buying, residents of the province are buying a deer bear license or they're buying a moose bear license. And the problem with this is that it doesn't really elevate the bear as a game animal. It's, it's essentially just adding it as a bonus to hunters that are going out for deer or moose. And so the other problem with this is that it's very difficult to find out how many bears are being harvested if you're, if you're buying combination systems. So if you buy a deer bear license and you go out and you kill a deer and then you kill a bear, you're, you're going to most likely report the deer and there's, there might not be a mechanism in place to report you know, how many bears you killed that season. The other issue is that there are no bag limits initially for black bears. And what I mean by a bag limit, this is the, the allowable kill that you can take. So if you were to buy a black bear license in 1961, you could kill as many bears as you like. There was no regulation in place to say that one license equals one bear as we have now. And the larger issue with this system was that many in the province still viewed the animal as, as vermin. We talked about how under the bounty system, it really cemented these ideas, hardened these attitudes that black bears were nothing more than pests. And of course, residents were being paid money to kill them. Now the government reverses the legislation and now says, you know what, bears are now game animals, now you pay us to kill them. So a lot of residents are initially cool to this idea. They say, well, you know what, I don't think of the bear as a game animal, I think of it as a pest, and I don't want to buy a game license from you, I still want you to pay me to kill them. So again, these are some of the issues that we'll encounter with these types of attitudes that people have over a number of years. Just because the government changed the legislation doesn't mean this is going to change or alter attitudes on the ground or change practices. Sorry, this is supposed to be uh, supposed to be crossed out on, on my original slide. So it's actually Play on words, it's not an Ontario tradition, it's an American tradition. We're going to talk about spring bear hunting again. So for the most part, after this change in 1961, it's not the residents that are hunting bears in the fall, and especially not in the spring. As I said, years and years of, uh, of being uh, programmed to think of them as, as pests and vermin doesn't change at the, at, at the drop of a hat. And so for the most part, the pressure that we see uh, especially in the spring bear hunt, is coming from non-resident hunters that, for the most part, are from the United States. And they're especially keen to hunt bears in the spring. They also, they're also very, uh, very keen to come over in the fall and hunt bears, but for the most part, the spring bear hunt season is predominantly uh, American activity. And so, in turn, this is a benefit because this, this interest and this pressure coming from American hunters 
does help the system. It prompt it, it, it eventually over time forces the government to reevaluate the system, bring in more controls, bring in more measures to kind of regulate it so that bears aren't being killed indiscriminately. But again, this also reveals that residents, for the most part, did not show any interest in spring or fall hunting until the 1980s. This is largely an American activity. Residents are not coming out in any significant numbers, especially in the spring season, because for the most part, we did not have that bear hunting tradition in Ontario. We had a bear killing tradition in Ontario, but it wasn't a sport hunting tradition that you would see in other states in the United States, in, in America. We're, we're, we're from, you know, where a lot of these hunters are coming from. And they're coming from far, they're not just coming from adjacent states like Minnesota, or New York, or Wisconsin, or wherever. Uh, they're also coming from Florida, they're coming from Tennessee, they're coming from all over the United States to come spring bear hunting in Ontario. And so this will just give you an idea of, of the amount of licenses that are, that are sold between the years of 1961 and 1990. This includes fall and spring licenses. And the top, uh, the top line in red, these are non-resident hunters. So these are people largely from the United States. And you can see the huge gap between the number of licenses purchased by non-residents versus licenses purchased by residents of the province. There's a huge gap here, and, for, and it doesn't actually, they don't actually equal out until the 1980s. So again, for the most part, if you're looking at resident interest, it's pretty much non-existent until there's a, a significant spike in 1979. And then we sort of see it equal out in the 1980s where residents are now starting to hunt bears almost on par with their, res, with their non-resident counterparts. And again, part of the reason why we see this shift in attitudes is as we get into the 1980s, or even, even in the early 1970s, with all these non-residents coming to the province, bear hunting is starting to become a big business. Uh, it's not only big business for the government, uh, they're selling licenses. So if you're selling 15,000 licenses in a given year, that's, that's considerable money that's coming in, but this is also money that's being generated by guides and outfitters in these local uh, Northern Ontario communities. So this is a huge surge in business. So for the most part, black bear hunting as a business kind of drives resident interest. Not only does it drive residents to say, you know what, maybe I can make some extra money guiding or maybe this will add to my business as an outfitter, I should start catering to non-resident hunters. So in turn, I think the money kind of fuels this interest and we start to see because of this, more and more residents are buying licenses and they're hunting them for support in addition to starting their own businesses and catering to non-resident hunters. So despite the fact that bear hunting is becoming a big business, especially in the especially the spring bear hunt in the 1980s, opposition to the activity flares up in the mid-1990s. We start to see organized and well-funded opposition coming from uh, a, a variety of groups that are coming together around the same cause. You have groups such as the Animal Alliance of Canada, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, uh, World Wildlife Fund, and also the Federation of Ontario Naturalists, which is now Ontario Nature. So again, a lot of these groups don't necessarily see eye to eye ideologically on hunting issues, but again, they were able to coalesce around these issues associated with the spring bear hunt. And for the most part, this issue was ethical concerns about orphan cubs. It's illegal to kill lactating sows in the, in the spring, but again, mistakes do happen, and oftentimes uh, mother bears are killed, leaving the cubs orphan where, for the most part, they will die. But they can't provide for themselves at this time of year. They're subject to predation, and they'll simply, they could also just simply starve to death. So this was the rallying cry about the spring bear hunt, was that it's unethical to have this because of the fact that you know, cub, you couldn't safeguard against these cubs that would be orphaned and would die. And so these groups are using a lot of provocative imagery. You have a picture here where it's a cute, cuddly black bear caught in the crosshairs, and the tagline is, it's spring and she wants her mom, unfortunately, so did a hunter. So again, these are, these, these tug at the heartstrings. They are, they are, they do, they did do their job. They often were timed around Mother's Day. Again, they would do a surge around Mother's Day to trigger these, you know, fam maternal and family instincts, again, to kind of uh, drum up the cause. And so we, this is the dominant narrative in the 90s, is that everything is focusing on orphan cubs. It doesn't matter how many cubs are being orphaned, the fact that there's one in any given season is too much for, for some of these groups to, to stand. And so this becomes, a, by the mid-90s, with all this sustained lobbying, there's a huge media blitz. We see thousands of billboards, uh, postcards, uh, radio spots, television ads, all centered around 
the orphan cub issue. And so by towards 1999, it's becoming pretty apparent that this is going to be a pivotal issue leading up to the general election in Ontario in the fall of 1999. Now the rumor has it that Premier Harris, uh, leader of the Pro Progressive Conservatives, met with the gentleman that was funding a lot of these groups, Robert Schatt. Uh, he, was, uh, he was the owner of Husky Injection Molding Systems, but he, was also, he also contributed uh, greatly to environmental causes. And the rumor is that him and Harris met in an airplane hangar at Pearson. Whether or not that's true makes for a good story. As a historian, I'd like it to be true, but again, this is just the story we hear. And they agreed that Schatt would put down his, his guns and Harris would cancel the hunt. Because what was going to happen was, it was made clear to Harris that they would start targeting key ridings in the election, and it would focus around the government's inaction on the spring bear hunt. So they said, you have an election coming up. If you don't want the spring bear hunt to be a focal point or a distraction for you, you should cancel the hunt. So Harris agrees, and they abruptly cancel the hunt on January 15th, uh, 1999. And this came as a shock to a lot of outfitters and guides in Northern Ontario. They weren't consulted about this. Uh, the, the province's Fish and Wildlife Advisory Committee was also not consulted. And this was a problem because you had a lot of these, hunt, these guides and outfitters that had taken deposits for the upcoming spring season. They had taken a lot of money to pay bills or pay for other supplies and equipment, and then all of a sudden they're being told by the government, no, there is no spring bear hunt. You're gonna have to refund all your clients. And so if you talk to even now, a lot of these, a lot of these outfitters, uh, this was a significant uh, blowback for them. They'd lost a lot of money. Some had gone bankrupt, some are still recovering from this because of the fact that the spring bear hunt provided a significant source of income for them at a time when they weren't normally generating money. This is before spring fishing starts, this is before uh, fall hunting starts, so again, they were really dependent on the spring bear hunt to kind of uh, provide a little bit of extra cash injection. This is called their shoulder season to provide that extra money. And so that's, that's another point that we could maybe get into later is that regardless of the fact of why the spring hunt was canceled and whether or not we believe that the spring bear hunt has led to an increase in the bear population, which I would say it hasn't, but we can discuss that as well. But the real issue is that this was a legitimate loss of millions of dollars. This was a big business at the time, and this did impact uh, Northern Ontario tourist outfitters and, and these local communities that were catering to uh, non-resident, even resident hunters that were eager to hunt bears in the springtime. And so this brings us to uh, our first discussion of the importance of place, uh, the role of geography in this debate. And now the decision was depicted as the government caving, uh, and these are not my terms, I'm using these from articles and, and discussions, depicted as the government caving to bleeding hearts from Toronto, from suburban southern Ontario, and so this starts the narrative of north versus south. So this is depicted as, well, if you oppose a spring bear hunt, you must live in a high rise in Toronto, you must not know what a bear looks like. And that's the dominant narrative that we hear. And this is largely coming from the groups that were you know, detrimentally uh, affected by the cancellation. But again, we still hear this today, and we'll get to that shortly. Opponents of the decision had argued that politics had trumped science. For the most part, yes, this is, this is arguable for sure. Because again, the spring bear hunt wasn't canceled because of any ecological concerns that this was unsustainable to the population. It was canceled because there was the issue with orphan cubs. And now that, that could lead to a whole other debate, you know, what is the role of ethics in these wildlife management conversations? Should it play a factor? I think uh, ultimately, just because you're able to do a hunt like this that could, that targets the most vulnerable parts of the population doesn't necessarily mean you should, but that, you know, that should be a conversation that they could have. So again, this idea that we see this polarizing narrative emerge that, you know, regardless of where you live, unless you're from Northern Ontario, you can't possibly perceive what the real effects are on the ground. And this is problematic because, you know, there's a lot of experts that live in Southern Ontario, that have previously lived in Northern Ontario, that are hunters, that are professionally trained biologists. These are important uh, insights to have, but again, they're often dismissed. They were often dismissed because they were from Southern Ontario. So this idea that you could only be perceptive if you lived in Northern Ontario starts to emerge. And we'll see that in the, in the later debate as well. So this brings us to, after the cancellation, there's a lot of concerns from people in Northern Ontario that due to the fact that we're hunting less bears in the spring, this has led to an increase in the population. 
So responding to these claim or these concerns from residents that the population is getting out of control, this in turn is leading to a spike in nuisance bear activity. The province appoints the Nuisance Bear Review Committee in 2002. So over the course of 2002 to 2003, this committee is tasked with reviewing the situation in Ontario with humans and, bear, and black bears and try to come up with a solution or at least a framework to help better govern this relationship. So it publishes its findings in 2003 and it finds no correlation between spring bear hunt and nuisance bears. There's, they argue that there's no correlation between a lack of spring bear hunting and a spike in nuisance behavior. In many ways, they argue that this is, maybe this is just merely perception that people living in these areas, we have more and more people living in bear country year round, so maybe this is a perceived increase in the number of bears because of how more, more people are encroaching in these areas. But what this does, despite arguing that there is, no, there is no impact or there is no connection between the two, the government argues for the implementation of BearWise in 2004. And so this is the program that many of us are familiar with now. It was brought in in 2004 to kind of oversee the relationship between humans and bears to promote the idea of education, to properly teach people the responsibilities to how to live with bears, how to interact with bears, uh, safely and, and properly in areas where the two would coexist. And so early on, this was a great program. The MNR was doing a ton of outreach. They had uh, been doing a lot of educational promotion with schools, with communities, with lo local police uh, through the form of this Bearwise program. I actually have a, a, some leftover Bearwise material at the end if you guys want to grab any. There's some fridge magnets and and door hangers and just some general tips on how to live uh, responsibly with bears in bear country or if you're visiting bear country. The problem with the Bearwise program is that it needs money to operate. And so by 2012, the government basically guts the program. Uh, they, they lay off a lot of bear technicians. They, uh, they, lay, they reduce the trapping and relocation program. I'll get to that later if you want, whether or not that has any merits. And they also start downloading responsibilities to local police departments and, and how to take care of nuisance bear uh, problems. And again, this is an issue as well because police, this is not the responsibility of police services. They're not equipped to deal with this and of course they have far more important things to do a lot of the time. So again, we had this good relationship, this good program in place where the government had advocated not only managing bears but managing people. But by 2012, it's clearly not on the priority list. So they, they basically get rid of this program which leads us back uh, to the debate right now. So after they slash bearwise uh, in the summer of 2013, uh, Minister of Natural Resources David Orsetti he says that there are no issues due to a lack of spring bear hunting, and also that bear nuisance bear incidents are down. So that's his stance in the summer of 2013. By November of 2013, Orzetti now says that they need to bring in a spring bear hunt pilot project because not only are nuisance bear incidents up, but there is a connection between a lack of spring bear hunting and a spike in activity. So a bit of a waffle there in terms of how the government was approaching this. And for the longest time, this was the most that the government had conceded to even address. Uh, for the most part, it's, it's kind of thought as a political napalm. You don't want to touch the spring bear hunt issue because it's so controversial, especially not only in northern Ontario, but it elicits a lot of responses from the south as well. So it's a divisive issue that, for the most part, the major parties were not keen to open or even touch. So Orzetti announces this pilot project, which is going to focus on eight wildlife management units across the province. They're centered on five major centers, North Bay, Timmins, Sault Ste. Marie, Sudbury, and of course, North Bay. So again, these are the five major centers in the north, and the spring bear hunt is going to take place in, in these adjacent wildlife management units. So the one we're gonna talk about, the spring bear hunt here in North Bay, the one that applies is wildlife management unit 41. That's where the spring bear hunt is currently going on right now in this area. So much like the ministry's findings, its own findings in 2003, there's been other studies that have shown that there is no evidence to indicate that a spring bear hunt will reduce human, negative human bear interactions. The best way to prevent this is, is proper education and, and how to live with the animals, and then of course, 
The other issue that drives nuisance bear activity is the availability of natural food sources. So in a year when food sources are unavailable or they're you know, poor supply, this is going to dictate uh, the type of nuisance bear activity we will see in a given year. So it's impossible to forecast year to year if we're gonna have a bad year. We know that some years that given how long the winter was, bears are coming out of hibernation now, and a lot of their normally uh, naturally, naturally occurring food sources are unavailable right now because they're not, they haven't grown yet. So again, this, this could be a problem, but again, you can't forecast this year to year. So that's, so the emphasis should be on education in that, in that sense, because again, the pilot project will not necessarily reduce the number of bears to a significant level that would bring uh, nuisance activity down. So the pilot's going on right now. It's going. It's supposed to run for two years. Uh, the next season will be uh, May 2015 to June 2015. But again, because it's occurring in in eight units in these five different areas, it's going to be very difficult to assess the effectiveness of the hunt. Because, like I said, there is ne not necessarily any evidence to suggest that the two have a connection. So if let's, for example, we have a bad barrier because natural food sources are down. That could lead to an increase of nuisance behavior, despite the fact that we have a pilot going on. It's also complicated by the fact that these are all five different centers. They all have their own different ways of reporting or even different ways of collecting garbage. So this all has individual impacts on how uh, the human bear relationship is managed in these areas. So again, it's not, an e it's not gonna be, the variables aren't the same across the board. So again, this kind of complicates the picture of, you know, maybe the spring bear hunt pilot works in North Bay, but how do we know it worked the same in Sudbury? Because again, the two cities are different. They have different ways of dealing with bears. They have different ways of dealing with humans and garbage. So again, that's another issue that we have to take into effect. So you, you might ask, well then why is it back? Why is the government bringing back the spring bear head if everyone's saying, or at least I'm saying, that it's not gonna be effective? Well, for the most part, the liberals are marketing it as a public safety measure. They're saying that if you bring the spring bear head back, this will reduce the number of negative human interactions and therefore will keep everybody in Northern Ontario safe, or at least in these communities that are affected by nuisance bears. It will help keep them safe. And so we see a switch in the argument now. Previously, those that were supportive of the spring bear hunt, they'd argued that politics had trumped science and canceled their hunt. And now those that are opposed to the spring bear hunt are now again reversing the narrative and saying politics is again trumping science and they're bringing the spring bear hunt back, not because Science says that it's a good idea, but because it's being marketed as a public safety measure. And so again, the idea is, 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 this, is this a political opportunity or is this a genuine push by the government to try to remedy the issue in Northern Ontario? That's, that's a subject we can save uh, for discussion or for questions. Again, it's up to you depending on how you guys have followed the story or not, but that's, that's an issue that people are asking now that's coming more into the debate is, you know, how does politics play a, a, a role in this discussion? So again, this whole idea of place-based knowledge of where you live kind of has an impact on, on your credibility or whether or not people will, will take your viewpoint uh, seriously. And again, these are terms gleaned from uh, comment sections on newspapers or on, on websites. Again, I'd encourage people not to read the comment sections a lot of the time unless uh, it's, it's usually not very productive and it's, it could derail your day. Your day. But you'll see terms like southern obliviousness, uh, tree hugger. So if you oppose a spring bear hunt, you must you couldn't possibly have an idea what you're talking about, or you're a tree hugger, which you know for some people is a bad thing. I personally don't necessarily think it's bad, but again, depending on where you live, to call somebody that is is pejorative. Um, letter writers from southern Ontario are immediately discredited because of where they live. Now I live in Sudbury, so in the last couple of weeks, the Star has published misguidedly, uh, a couple letters to the editors from people from Southern Ontario. And while these letters were good, they had some important points. Oftentimes, I think that the letters were published purposely because the author's locations are evident in their bio. It says, this person is from Kitchener, this person is from Whitby. And of course, the online community goes right after them. That, oh, you're from Kitchener, why don't you worry about your own problem in Kitchener? Or what do you know about having bears in your backyard in Kitchener? And this just devolves into name calling, uh, personal attacks, and it's often centered on this location. The issue with this too is that it's still going on that uh, in Sudbury we have a lot of biologists that live in the area that have studied bears in the field for years. They also hunt, they don't necessarily spring hunt, but they do hunt, and they live in bear country, but their 
their, uh, their credentials come under attack because people think that if you oppose a spring bear hunt, you must live in a high rise in Toronto or you must uh, spend your monthly paycheck on, on PETA donations, right? So this, this is an issue. So again, scientific experts are questioned because of where they might live. Now just to give you, give you an example, not necessarily to pump my own tires or anything, but I did an, I did an online interview with one of the producers from uh, TVO's Agenda. And before we did our online interview, he asked me to tell the viewers, however, maybe the four of them that watched it, they, he asked me to tell them where I was from. And he prefaced the question to me before we went on the air is basically saying, you're from McMaster, why are you going on TVO telling these people about the history of the Spring Bear Hunt? What could you possibly know? I mean, the fact of the matter is, while I do go to McMaster, I don't live in Hamilton. I've lived in Serbia, I've lived in Northern Ontario for the, the better part of my life. But again, this was a concern that they thought of that, how can we put this guy on the web if people are going to think that he's living in Hamilton talking about this? What could he possibly bring to the discussion? So again, this is coming up again more and more, this idea of north versus south, this idea that if you live in an urban location that you can't possibly have anything constructive to say to the conversation, that you're immediately dismissed because you don't live in the north. And so again, this brings us to the idea of local knowledge versus science. And I think it's important that we do remember that you know, local forms of knowledge and traditional forms of knowledge, these are important to the conversation as well. I think that if, you, if you're an outfitter, if you're a hunter, and you've, you've previously spent years doing bear hunts or providing spring bear hunts for uh, clients and customers, you also develop an intimate knowledge of the animal. You understand how its biology works, you understand the ecology of where this animal lives. You might not necessarily be a professionally trained biologist, but you still have a, a, a keen sense of insights that someone like me who doesn't spring bear hunt or, or provide outfitting services might not have. So I think that's important we keep that in mind as well, in addition to uh, the signs that are coming from these experts. The problem becomes is when those in, in the hunting or outfitting camp immediately dismiss the science, right? They say that, well, you, you, you work down in Queens Park, I live in the north, you can't possibly tell me you know, what is going on, right? And that's, and that's the issue for me, is that I, I, like, I try to keep an open mind, and I understand that outfitters can provide me with forms of knowledge that I possibly can't uh, replicate myself, and I take that into account, but the issue is when we put on our blinders and you don't listen to both perspectives, because again, they are valuable. The issue often becomes how do we integrate them together? How do we come up with a constructive conversation that doesn't just lead to a polarized, polarizing narrative? So this is an, th these are the figures that the MNR has for black bear harvests in WMU 41, so the, one, the wildlife management unit that the North Bay Spring Bear Hunt is going. And these are estimated harvests, are estimated harvests based on uh, hunter reporting. So again, these aren't definitive numbers; they're subject to statistical error because oftentimes these are extrapolations from year to year because no one really knows for sure definitively how many bears are killed in a year, just as the government doesn't know 100% how many bears there are in the province. We have our educated guesses, and we're, that these are the models that we're given to try to forecast. So again, up until 1999, we would have seen these figures account for fall and spring bear hunting in North Bay. So again, you see there's much more uh, hunting pressure here in 1995, fall and spring, but again, even in 1996 and 1998, there's a drop off again. So, and then after 1999, these figures just account for fall hunting. And so for the most part, the figures for this WMU are consistent with the pre spring and fall bear hunt numbers. So there, there's not a, there wasn't necessarily a huge drop off after the spring bear hunt was canceled. There's a drop off here in 2001 for whatever reason, but again, it, it climbs back up drops again and climbs again. So year to year dictates, you know, what is the interest in from non-resident hunters, what is the interest from resident hunters as well. Does that take into consideration that they extended the fall ball, uh, bear hunt into August? That's, yeah, so that's... So they skewed the numbers a little bit. Yeah, so, so yeah, so that's, that's another important point is that these numbers also, like you said, we started extending the fall hunt it now runs much longer than previously, uh, than previously existed. And in some areas, not necessarily in North Bay, but there are areas where they've also allocated more tags for hunters, right? So it's a first come, first serve basis. 
If you already bought a license, you killed your one bear for the year, you might be able to buy another license in areas that's just under bear, sudbury, areas that are deemed to have a healthy bear population. So this de definitely has an issue with the numbers as well. But this is just to give you an idea of how many bears were being killed in North Bay um, in this wildlife management unit. The other important takeaway is that the spring bear hunt that's running right now is only six weeks long, and it is only, uh, it's only available to resident hunters. And like you said, here we have a 10-week hunt that is open to resident and non-resident hunters. So obviously, there's going to be more bears killed during these years because you have a full extra month, and you have a full extra group of people coming into the area and hunting the animal. Now again, this is bear, these are bear-wise numbers that have been provided by the MNR, and this is based on the number of calls in a given year. And now much like the rest of the province, uh, North Bay had a significant spike in nuisance bear activity in 2006, 2007, but much like the rest of Ontario, there's been a significant drop off in nuisance bear complaints from 2007, 2008 onwards. So again, Orzetti says that calls are up, well, based on the MNR's own numbers, calls are down. We also have to keep in mind that the changes that happened to BearWise in 2012, the gutting of the program does have an impact on reporting. So the reporting system changes, which doesn't really give us uh, comparable numbers between 2012 and 2013. But again, you can still see that before we had significant cuts to BearWise, there is a significant, there is a steady reduction in these complaints and these interactions between humans and bears uh, from basically 2007 onwards. And so just to put these together, to show you the number of bears that are killed in the North Bay unit in comparison with the number of uh, nuisance bear complaints, there's not necessarily a whole lot that would suggest that these two are correlated. You see that there are years of spikes in nuisance activity that are accompanied by spikes in hunting pressure. So again, that's an issue to keep in mind as well. So in a year where you're killing more bears than uh, the historical average also is accompanied by a, a high year of nuisance activity. And again, you see a spike in activity, there's another spike in hunting pressure. So again, these aren't definitive numbers, but they do kind of give you an insight into why people would say, you know, there is no correlation. The science says that there is no uh, cause and effect between hunting and nuisance complaints, and that chiefly this is being driven by natural food availability. With the drop off there too, could that be attributed to the fact that there was no action being taken with regards to complaints? So if you got the program, you're not setting the MNR to do anything, people are just going to stop calling. Yeah, and that's and that's exactly <laughs> the issue. Right? So I'm not going to complain about it anymore. I'm just going to do something. Yeah, because for the most part, your complaints are going to they they stop doing uh, land uh, on-site visits to landowners where the bears were uh, you know repeat problems, and they stop doing the trap and relocation program. Right. So again, this is why these these numbers are a little more skeptical because the program changes so significantly that there is no universal way to track. You know, what were the pre-2012 calls looked like because of the way the system was reconfigured, right? Because you also have people calling the police more often because the government's downloading a lot of these responsibilities to the, to the police. So again, because of that, the police aren't doing, they're not implementing a bearwise program. They don't really care. They're just responding to the calls. So there's no way of looking at these police calls and saying, well, we had five calls in a week. Is that five different bears? Or is that the same bear that's you know, uh, being attributed to these different areas? So again, this is a problem as well. So. The history of the spring bear hunt has been driven by competing perspectives. It's often polarizing. Um, we also, I like to point out that you know it has a much longer history than maybe some of, some of you had thought of today. It goes back to 1937, and again, the idea of ethics, of science, and location uh, continue to dominate the discussion. This also this often seems to come up all the time. That again, just not to not to repeat my points because maybe there'll be time for discussion. We can talk about this later. But again, this whole idea of of north versus south, or of urban versus periphery, or science versus emotion. You know, I, I don't think that this issue, it's very complicated. I don't think there's a band-aid solution for it, but I don't think that we should necess necessarily try to see it in black and white terms, because again, there is much that can be learned between the two sides, but oftentimes the problem is, is trying to accommodate these two perspectives, which are often so, uh, so polarizing. So, um, with that said, uh, I appreciate you taking the time and listening to me today. I always enjoy talking about my research when I can, especially when it's timely, uh, like it is right now. We have the spring bear hunt going on. So, if there's, uh, we have some time. I finished a little bit early. So, if you want to, if you have any questions, or if you want to just discuss uh, the spring bear hunt or anything else I talked about today, I'm definitely uh, willing to do that. So, thank you.
exceeded your jurisdiction and canceled the hunt without, uh, without properly over looking at what is the ecological impact of this and what is the financial impact. Uh, they ultimately argued that at first that the minister had exceeded his powers by doing this. They were unsuccessful in that. And then their second argument was hinged on the fact that spring bear hunting was somehow an, an inalienable charter right, that they were protected under the charter, uh, and that they should be able to still continue to do this activity. Again, that was unsuccessful. So. In the end, uh, Noto pulled out before the OFAH. I think the OFAH kind of went, they continued with the with the lawsuit until roughly around uh, I think it was 2003 or 2004. Some of these outfitters in the province did get money back from the government for lost uh, wages and lost revenue from these hunts. But again, uh, their their core arguments were unsuccessful in trying to convince the government that this was a right that they had to pursue spring hunting. Thank you. Do you know what article of the charter they were arguing under? It was uh, it was under freedom of expression, oh. Un under under that that this was some part of their freedom of expression that this was part of their their hunting heritage so to speak and so again the the issue even with arguing that this is your your hunting heritage too is that the fact that you know how do you how do you this is a very subjective way of looking at it right especially given the fact that Ontario's not really had a, a bear hunting heritage in terms of uh, of how they were arguing right so again it's just uh, it's. It's a difficult, it's a difficult way to try to uh, to bring the hunt back, and then we we've seen recently that uh, the Animal Alliance of Canada and Zoo Check they tried to bring legal action against the government before the hunt had started to try to stall stall the pilot project from proceeding. And again, they argued that the spring bear hunt was fell under the criminal code that it was under uh, animal cruelty, and that because the cubs were being you know, potentially being orphaned and starved to death, that this constituted animal cruelty. And again, it's a very subjective point of view, but the other issue that I think I've, the government hasn't released why they said no to this court argument, but again, I think that you open that Pandora's box to animal cruelty in hunting, you're opening yourself up to other, again, this is very subjective, right? Because you could argue all sorts of other forms of, of hunting could also be deemed as cruel, especially if an animal is wounded, and et cetera, right? So I think you probably didn't want to get too bogged down in that debate. Well, that's another example of uh, the Animal Alliance is that they're petitioning for the uh, the deer problem they have in Holton region, um, and they, they want the ministry wanted to open it up to, to further First Nations harvesting of the deer, mm -hmm. and the Animal Alliance just say let them starve to death and die naturally. Yeah, but as they, as they destroy everything there, because it seemed to me to kill them. Well, I kind of see that that, that polarization there. Yeah. there. But also, too, is the um, among my note here is, is the term nuisance bear, and how it's applied in political circles and in, in management circles and how it's perceived in for, for communities. You know, I perceive a nuisance bear as a, as a bear that has a has an ecological impact. And I, when I look at the map and the YMUs on the heels of the uh, moose tag allotment uh, that just happened in the last two weeks, mm -hmm. um, is is there is there some trying to balance act there? Because I, I perceive a nuisance bear as a bear that maybe might be a, a nuisance to the moose population or the deer population, you know, rather than and a bear in my backyard, he's not hurting anybody. But. Yeah, and I, that's the thing. The nuisance, yeah, the term nuisance bear has definitely become like a politically charged term and it's thrown around. I think you'll, you'll often hear a lot of people try to avoid the, the term nuisance bear, try to just use negative human bear interaction or negative human bear relationship because, again, like you said, just because he's in your backyard, does that necessarily constitute a nuisance? Is he, you know, is he, yeah, exactly, right? But again, there, there is evidence to say that obviously un, unchecked black bear populations do have a negative impact on ungulate groups, right? So moose, calves, there's been studies done in Alaska, uh, or no, sorry, yeah, Alaska and Newfoundland with the car caribou in Newfoundland. Manitoba, and I think it's North Dakota, attribute calf losses at 50% due to the black bear population. Yeah, so it, it is a real thing for sure that when, when these groups do argue that, you know, having a spring bear hunt unchecked or, or limiting our black bear hunting that does have that could have a negative impact on the moose calf population whether or not that's behind 
the MNR's recent uh, change to the you know to the group size and guaranteed group size tags. I'm not sure. I think that uh, I don't know if it's just that they're trying to just kind of put the brakes on it to kind of reassess the actual numbers and, and what the impact is. But again, I, I predation by blockers is a definitely a genuine issue that does come up, which further increases the the economical situation of Northern Ontario people that are that are reliant on the uh, on the industry. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're all they're all tied up together, right? So again, it's 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 a complicated issue for sure. Though. Exactly. Fuzzy bear, calf moose. Yeah, it's, it's it's driven by uh, you know your perspective and, and how you view the animal, right? So I think it's uh, that's also something to keep in mind too. You, you mentioned with the deer call uh, in the halter, and again, groups like the Animal Alliance of Canada, they they're for the most part ideologically opposed to any form of hunting, right? So we see them talk about the spring bear hunt and an orphan cub, but for the most part, they they object to any form of hunting. So well, we have a complementary um, calf tag, but for, for calf hunting in Ontario, basically, with the exception of five YMUs. It's if you buy a license, you're allowed to shoot a calf moose. Mm -hmm. So a baby moose versus, you know, a baby bear, you know, and then the economic impact on that too is moose hunting more popular than bear hunting. And, you know, how do people make their lives? Um, as well as the tag system. You know, it, it's not universally applied um, science. You know, if you say, well, uh, I have a cow tag, well, my chances of getting a cow tag, there's 55 cow tags in YMU, um, or not even 55, 20 cow tags in YMU. If I get one, which is a sheer luck, um, am I not gonna? Am I gonna pass up the opportunity to do the ethical thing? You know, to shoot the cat, the cow, and leave the calf off to its own thing. Also, it's you know, it's two, two tables. Yeah. So different different animals have different you know cuddle factors. Yeah, no, it's it, the bear. <laughs> Definitely, that's true. The, the idea of that, you know, what kind of causes people rally behind, and, and definitely that that is a factor that I think more and more people are looking at uh, in terms of actual some scientific studies and just uh, social science studies on, you know, what is the impact of if you look at an animal that's cute and cuddly, that's obviously a little bit easier to uh, to rally behind as well. So I mean, we had I could have brought in some other examples of uh, of the previous campaign, but again. And Noto and their charter, charter right thing, where they bought out by the province because they were promoting ecotourism with, with provincial money and federal money. That I as, as, a, as an offset, because that's you know, it's, it's, is it a political decision to drop my challenge? Because it, 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 if I'm challenging it, my access to that provincial funding or federal funding will disappear. That that I don't know because I haven't. Uh, for the most part, my uh, the dissertation looks up to the 1989. This is going to be a year for. Uh, some big changes to bear management. We, they brought in an actual comprehensive bear management program, is what they call it, right? So I kind of stopped there. I'm looking more at the spring bear hunt now because it's in the news again. I hope that uh, once my dissertation is done, I'll have an, an extra chapter to kind of deal with the spring bear hunt. But again, Noto dropping out of that lawsuit was contentious between OFAH and Noto, right? Because at first they went into it together, and then for some reason, Noto dropped off, right? Maybe that was because the government was allocating money to these, these groups that had lost. Uh, Dollars out, they were just trying to recover and bring them back. Yeah, and they found out the hard way that ecotourism doesn't give them the same amount of economic punch as, as American bear hunters. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious in your research, have you found how First Nations dealt with uh, the spring bear hunt? So they're still an active guiding community with the many First Nations. How did they deal with the spring bear hunt? And did any of your researches come across? The, in terms of the cancellation? Yeah, so they would obviously not necessarily be subject to that regulation, right? So on the reserve, there's still an active guiding hunting uh, industry that goes yeah. on. So I was just curious if you'd come across any sort of discussion or any sort of information on whether or not uh, First Nations continue on with the spring bear hunt as part of their you know, uh, tourism industry. Yeah, um, but no, unfortunately, I haven't got to that part yet. That's definitely an interesting point, especially in light of the cancellation, because what you had, you had many of these groups that were opposing the spring hunt originally, they almost, uh, if you look at some of their letterhead, uh, they came, they coalesced under this this uh, group called the Bear Alliance. So it was a number of groups together, and you'd often see that they they appropriated First Nations uh, symbolism and imagery of their bear logo, and their idea was that they argued that you know First Nations had never spring bear hunted, and so they were either invoking this whole idea, this this fallacy of the ecological Indian that if, if they're not spring bear hunting, then no one else in the province should be spring bear hunting, right? But again. Historically, uh, 
there's many first nations groups across North America have spring bear honey because again, if you're hunting uh, for sustainable uh, for sustenance, spring bear honey is generally the easiest way to get the animal. Right, you know where the animal uh, is den for the winter, and then you come back in the spring and you're able to harvest the animal. And again, that's a it's a much more rich culture in terms of you know their reverence for the bear and, and how they and how they hunt the bear and the different ceremonies after the bear has been hunted. But again. So that's, that's, that's as far as in terms of the First Nations impact, all I've seen so far is just how the imagery has been kind of uh, appropriated by these groups that push this agenda that, you know, these are, these are they're, they're marketing them as the chief stewards of the province, but, so if they're not doing it, then nobody else should, like you say, that's not necessarily the case, right? And I think that would be an interesting uh, point to look at afterwards, is how, how are these uh, communities uh, dealing with that afterwards, because they wouldn't be subject to necessarily the same uh, regulations. Talk about American hunters as being a major stakeholder in all this. How much power do they have in shaping politics here? Um, well, there was uh, Ted Nugent, the, the, the rock and roller from Michigan, after the hunt was canceled, he had, uh, he had advocated a boycott. He said that uh, I'm starting a boycott of any tourist hunting and fishing in, in Ontario. And he was trying to rally behind, he was trying to get Americans to rally behind and say, like, don't go to Ontario for anything because they've taken away our spring bear hunt. So, um, they're definitely part of these of these lobby groups as well. So I mean, they do they do pay into this system, um, and some of them have property here as well as part of this system. Like they also, if you have property, you could be a guide as well or an outfitter, right? So again, that's that's another issue that I'd like to look at as well. I don't really have a, a clear cut answer of what you know what kind of political power they wielded in the wake of these decisions. Um, is there any real evidence in regards to this whole orphan cub issue as to whether or not? You know, does happen and to what extent, or is that just something that we haven't been able to, to really keep tabs on because of the way things are managed? No, that it does exist. Uh, the up until '87, there wasn't any met, there wasn't any legislation in place to deal with that. But by the '80s, the MNR is acutely aware of you know this type of PR that this could do. So they bring in legislation to to legally make uh, orphaning so you can't shoot sows in the springtime and you can't shoot cubs and therefore you can't orphan them. Um, I think it was it was in, during the 90s, the MNR had done its own study uh, based on a, one particular wildlife management unit, and based on this, they extrapolated that the number of cubs that could be orphaned in a given year was, you know, something like, I think the number they used was 276. So what then happened was this these groups that were opposed to orphan cubs, they, they actually had the numbers in their hand now, right? They always argued that this was a possibility that you know, you can't guarantee that everyone is going to hunt responsibly. You can't guarantee that everyone is going to uh, distinguish between male and female bears. But once they had that number, they kind of ran with it, saying that you know what, every year 276 died because of this, and for them it didn't really matter what the true number was, right? The fact of the matter was, is even if there's five or if there's three, that's too much, right? And so, it, it is an, a legitimate issue, and I mean, that's that's really it becomes more complicated with the ethical side of things, right? Because overall. If you had, even if you had uh, you know 276 cubs orphan, that's not necessarily going to have a negative impact on the long-term sustainability of black bears in Ontario, right? It's a very healthy, robust population. It's the third largest in North America. But you know, does that mean we necessarily need to uh, needlessly target the more vulnerable sections of the population, right? That's that's a whole other can of worms, right? And I think that's kind of what they they how they approach it as well, right? So. There's a question of, I have a question with regards to funding, you know, and the impact as the, the management of natural resources as a whole, and how that, the, the, the bear, the, the bear hunt alone has had a negative impact on reduced funding um, for the MNR because mm -hmm. of less licensing. Not to say that all the licensing money goes to the MNR to, for the management of the resources that it's intended for. Um, there's an article in the North Bay paper, a couple of, uh, those are the paintings, sorry. That, that you know, it goes in provincial coffers mm -hmm. and it's distributed to things like the gay bride uh, parade in, in Toronto. Uh, whereas you know, the, the, the hunting and the economy in northern Ontario is, is slowly dying, and there's no man. You know, there's one conservation uh, officer for all of James Bay Lowland going all the way up to the border of, uh, of Ontario that goes into reporting as well. So mm -hmm. it's that balance of political decision. It's costing taxpayers more money on so many more levels, you know, management and loss of revenue in the economy. And it seems overly political. You know, and it, 
doesn't take in all the other geographical factors and forestry. Mm -hmm. You knock down a whole forest, a whole bunch of blueberries come up. Well, the bears have lots of blueberries, and you know where they go. So is forestry increasing the bear population or increasing the population? Yeah, so it's, different. It's, it's the systematic approach rather than just focusing on we got bears. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely interconnected for sure, right? Because even before the bear wise cuts or, the, or even cuts to hunting, you know, the MNR has been downsizing itself in the last few years recently, right? They're closing offices, and you know, I think they closed the office in uh, between Sudbury and uh, I think Blind River office Blind closed. Blind River office closed. Yeah, so again, you're losing staff there, right? And the, the office obviously has an impact on, on reporting and, and dealing with these animals, right? And not just black bears, but all the other natural resources that are under the MNR's uh, stewardship. So, yeah. I mean that's it's not it's just it's not just one thing part and parcel of the larger system, right? So just to finish off uh, a question for the students interested in perhaps doing graduate work, how do you how did you become interested in your subject matter and what type of sources do you use? Okay, yeah. I uh, well I uh, I got into environmental history when I started doing my masters at Laurentian and then when I went to McMaster to start my PhD, I had to come up with a topic, and I originally stumbled on uh, the topic of black bear hunting in Manchin because of the political controversy with the 1999 decision. I figured that'd be a good environmental history topic because it has all the makings of controversy and all these other, you know, natural resource management, different attitudes uh, towards natural resources and how this is an impact on, on how we uh, regulate them. And so, in terms of sources, uh, I was, I've been able to kind of get together a patchwork from different archives. So I've been, I've gone to the Archives of Ontario, which is at York University. Uh, I've also had access to the MNR's library in Peterborough, so they keep a lot of their own files there. They have a, a, a number of other reports. And then I also, if you like, uh, if you want to tie your research into vacation, I went to Algonquin Park two years ago. They have a nice archives there as well. So I went camping for the week, and I spent a, a few days in the visitor center going through all their files. And they have a, a wealth of files on black bears, wolves, deer, etc. And then, uh, yeah, so I've, I've been able to kind of go to different centers and I think that's, it is difficult at times because of how I talked to you about how, you know, black bears weren't really important uh, in Ontario up until the 80s and so it's difficult to find the sources to kind of back up a lot of the stuff you'll see in the newspaper because again, the Department of Lands and Forest didn't necessarily think of black bears as a, tar as a, a focus of management in the 30s and 40s, so again, there's not a lot of documentation to kind of go with that. Right? So I've had to do a lot of, uh, of backfilling, so to speak, going through a lot of newspapers to try to fill these sources. And I've also used some, some oral history where possible to kind of uh, to supplement a lot of the research I've done. So I think uh, talking to people as well that were, especially in the later years with the spring bear hunt debate, I, was, I did a lot of calls with outfitters that, that were impacted by this decision. Right? So I think that's another way you can supplement your written sources or your scientific sources is, is through oral history as well. So that's, that's another avenue you can take.